Whew, guys, it's, it's been a week. It's been an amazing week, and um, there's been revival in the air. There's been revival in the airwaves and social media, but there's also been revival in this space, and I, I, I'm excited. It's, it's a real privilege to be speaking. Uh, how's it, Tristan? How are you doing, bro? Welcome, welcome. Um, it's amazing to be speaking into a space with such backing from the Spirit, such backing from our worship. It is exciting and it is encouraging uh, to be in a time like this. Sometimes we think we wish we could be here or there, or, but we are here now and what a treat. And uh, for those of you that are unfamiliar with the word of revival, um, it actually isn't the word revival in the Bible. The closest word I can find is repentance, which is actually our hearts are turning. Our, our ways are turning and we're focusing on our king and our, our labeling this week of our, our worship evenings have been, we're going to adore him. And we have been, and there's been repentance in hearts and revivals in our community, and it's amazing. And what I like to do when this thing starts stirring up is I, I, I like to, like, let's look back and see some of the revivals that we've had before, and my point to do that is not to form a theology around that, but actually to see and be reminded of what can arrive when a revival happens. So I first of all want to preface this by saying it's such a pity that Google doesn't have much recorded of our revivals here in the valley because we know there have been revivals there and there have been revivals in Africa and all over the places. Uh, so don't be fooled when you Google about revivals that is just happening in America. <laughs> But I'll mention some that, that, that I did find for the sake of my fact-checking. Um, I, I mentioned the ones that I did find there. And in 1730, um, and then again 100 years later, they had what they called the first great awakening and then the second great awakening. And what we saw is that the church started teaching some really tough truths. Tough in terms of what we think and tough in terms of a society where they say moral decay was rife. And we saw a massive repentance uh, in that, and the morality of society started being formed once more. In, uh, we've got uh, load shedding back, I see. Hallelujah. Load shedding uh, for the, the gents, we know, uh, gives us an opportunity to walk out our faith. When you go into the gents' bathroom, there's no light at all, and you're not walking by sight, but by faith. Um, but uh, I think if you go to the bathroom now, you'll have some light and some more, more direction. Um, in 1857, we saw what they called the prayer meeting revival where six people started praying in Fulton Street in New York. Mm, only six people, which started a revival which saw about 100 converts in the church in America and about 100 co converts in the church of Ireland and England. I'm Sorry, a million, sorry, a million. <laughs> yeah, that's not, not as exciting. <laughs> 100 is not as exciting as a million. In 18... 75, we saw the, the third great awakening where basically this man, D.L. Moody, started a, Moody, sorry, D.L. Moody, not Moody, this was in Durban. Um, <laughs> I'm getting excited about the Durban revival here. <laughs> he started a Bible study for street kids. And this Bible study grew so much to the point when even the president, Abraham Lincoln, started attending this Bible study. And we know what happened there with his presidency. In 1904, we saw the Welsh revival where this was labeled as the restoration of the Holy Spirit into the church. I've always said that's one of my favorite captions of a revival. Imagine if we could be a people known as restoring the Holy Spirit in our church. Beautiful. Two years later, we saw the Azusa Street Revival where we saw that this revival sparked an integration in the church between blacks and whites. That's pretty cool. The things that we start to see from these revivals are so special. And in 1994, a bit recent, we saw the Toronto blessing or the uh, Toronto outpouring. And this is so cool that the number one tourist destination in Canada that year was that church. There is an attractiveness to what happens when the spirit moves. And I'm saying these not to form a, a, a theology or methodizing how we get to those points, but I want to say that revival can look like different things, but revival is still a birth of the Spirit in our space. And this last few weeks, we've seen the Asprey revival. And if you haven't seen it, uh, your, 
Your Google algorithms obviously don't know you're Christian, so I think you need to work on that algorithms. Um, because I've seen it blowing up on my social media and, and doing some research into the people um, and the event coordinators into this, uh, this was a quote that I got from one of them. It says, the first day we had a very ordinary service. I would call it unremarkable. <laughs> and I wanna say that this unremarkable service has sparked something that I'm calling the social media revival because we have seen millions and millions of people across the globe almost overnight wanna partner with what God is doing from an unremarkable service. And I wanna say that when we see Christians do the ordinary, and when I say ordinary, I mean the things that we know we should be doing, that are in our word, that are in the gospel, that are in the apostles, what they taught us, when we start teaching and preaching the truth, when we start worshiping and adoring our king, when we gather as the saints, we see some amazing things happen. And, and someone described it like this to me. I said, sometimes revival comes in that like there's, there's a bucket and there, there's been actual words in, in uh, 2020 and 21 that have been spoken about an overflowing of this bucket. And sometimes it's just like you've just shoved a massive fire hydrant in there and they're just pumping it with water and it's overflowing. And sometimes every service we're pouring water into this bucket. And if I don't see it overflow this week, I'm gonna see it overflow next week, or next week, or next week. But I'm gonna keep doing the things that God has called me to do nonetheless. And I wanna say what we have been doing in this space, and give a bit of a summary in this year so far. We're ending Feb now already. And I wanna show how we as a church have been filling this bucket. And we're seeing overflowing now, what a treat. You know, we started the year with Caleb, and he preached about the secret place and our secret weapon is our time in intimate presence with God. We had a 24 hour prayer. I don't know if Chris is in the room. But we had 24 hours of prayer and we saw amazing things happen there. We had Roger the next week speak about the battlefield of the mind and we spoke about the Baal uh, priests cutting themselves and trying to get their um, sacrifice to burn up. And then we had um, uh, Elijah speak fire on it and saw these amazing things, but then some little lies of the enemy came through and we, he started to doubt. We saw Wayne speaking about picking up our cross and we need to understand and be convicted about what is our calling as the church. We see Keegan that was speaking about we are all called to follow Christ and we saw through Matthew the tax collector even and this gospel is for everyone. So Graham speak about worship and how it is such a part of our life and not just how, sing, how we sing. And actually we need to be saying yes to God before we even know what the question is. And we saw mom speak about obedience and about how these boundaries that God puts in us is for our freedom. And we had Daphne speak about pride and Obadiah about how when pride enters in, it is very hard to do all these things that we're talking about. And this is all building these fundamentals. And first of all, let's say we have some phenomenal preaching in this house. Some really, really great preaching. And there, there is this, this adding and adding and adding to this bucket. And this year has not just been us wandering around unintentionally. There has been intention behind what we are going after. And I also want to say the evening service, we have seen some amazing things. We've seen some incredible preaching. We've seen some incredible moves and, and we're sharing testimonies from Jesus festivals. And I, I mean, what time did it end on Sunday evening? Like 10.30 or load shedding, whenever that came in. Like <laughs> 10 o'clock. There, there are things happening. And we, we were privileged enough to meet with a whole bunch of church leaders on Thursday night and, and I was chatting to some of the leaders and there was quite a buzz in the room and to realize that it is not just this house that is pursuing that, not just this house that is seeing the stir of awakening. And some of the church leaders were saying like, sure, Steve, it is such a treat for the first time in many years for us to start a year as a church and as a body that we are on the front foot. Doesn't it feel like that a little bit? Don't you get excited when social media is talking about the small town in Kentucky called Asbury? 
Instead of all the terrible stuff happening, we get enough of that. And chatting to those church leaders on, on Thursday, it was quite interesting. It says, sometimes we do the same thing. We keep worshiping, worshiping we keep praying, and then bam, revival's on our doorstep. And for me, there was such a humbling moment of realizing, actually, us stepping into revival doesn't have a lot to do with me. <laughs> ah. But it has 100% to do with God stepping in. And sometimes we think it is, our, it is about, revival is about us flipping society on its head, but actually it's about partnering with God's will, which is to flip society on its head. And it's a subtle difference, but if we get it wrong, pride will creep in. And maybe we won't see the things of God's will because we're not partnering with that but our own will. You know, it's interesting, the definition of prayer, and maybe not by the um, like Oxford definition, but kind of our general definition of prayer is about us convincing God of our expectations. I'm going to say it again. How often do we think that the definition of prayer is us convincing God of our expectations? But in Hebrew, the, the word prayer, which is lehit palel, probably pronounced that terribly. Hannah literally had to write it for me, like how you say it. But lehit palel translates to God convincing us of his expectations. Yes. Mm. And that's quite humbling because often, and, and it does say bring your request to the Lord, of course, but actually the word prayer is about us understanding God's will and us understanding his expectations. And we, we see that again, we see confirmation of that in the Lord's Prayer where it starts, your kingdom come, your will be done. It doesn't say, Lord, please help me in my will here on earth. It says, may I help you, Lord, in your will here on this earth. And so we are called to be faithful in the pursuit of God's will. And actually, I, I believe that faithful pursuit looks like us pursuing the truths of the word that we know to be true and also listening out for the move of the spirit. Because like I said, like these church leaders identify, like actually they were doing the same things over and over again and being faithful to what God had said and called them to do but also listening out for, actually, let's go here now. Let's carry on worshiping, but maybe we need to be going after this. And we see that, that revivals are birthed often out of that. You know, we talk about the revival where there was someone who's just teaching kids on the street. We've always been called to teach, but sometimes the Spirit is going to say, actually, these children on this street need to be taught. We've always been called to pray. But sometimes the Spirit's going to say, we need the, these six people to pray in Fulton Street. We always are called to hold church meetings, but sometimes we need to have a church meeting next to a club, and all those people in the club end, club end up coming up into the church and starting revival from there. And it reminds me of, of the scripture we find in John 21 verse 6. You guys can go there now if you want. If you've got your... Actual Bible, you can. If you want to sneaky check your WhatsApp message, you can do that while you're looking at your app. John 21, verse 6. Sorry, verse 3, actually. I'm going to go from verse 3, but my point's in verse 6. Simon Peter told them, I'm going fishing. Cool, bro. We will go with you, they said. So they went out and got into the boat but caught nothing that night. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not recognize that it was Jesus. So he called out to them, children, have you caught any fish? I love that actually. He, he knew they didn't catch any fish. <laughs> no, they answered. So he told them, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast it there, 
and they were unable to haul it in because of the great number of fish. I love that story because I think it's quite easy to get into the minds of these disciples. They're fishing all night. I don't know if you guys have got a hobby. Well, in this case, it was their profession. I don't know if you've done something all night and had zero success. Have you ever been on Excel all night and you don't get your, your balancing figure at the end, eh? But that's where they're at. They, they literally have done their thing all night and they are professional fishermen. They've done it all night. And imagine, they, they said they didn't even recognize that it was Jesus. Imagine hearing a voice over there saying, hey guys, just literally instead of fishing here, like right here, you need to put your net there. Yo, guys, I do not know if I would have been so convinced. I'm like, surely fish don't just hang out one meter away for a whole night. (laughs) (laughs) But they were faithful in what Jesus was saying, and they literally moved their net here. They did the same thing. They didn't use new nets. They just took that net and put it there. The same ocean, the same boat, the same everything right there. And they caught more fish than they ever did. They couldn't even bring them out of the water. I bet those fish who were obedient to God were like, yes, why are we all chilling here? (laughs) We're so cramped. (laughs) It's like a thousand of us. We normally just hang out in the whole ocean. Now we're here. (laughs) (laughs) but in the moment where I think they might have been most demoralized to have faith to cast their net there if I was in exile all night and they said just do one control control C, control V I'd be like no bro I've been trying that eh?" (laughs) and maybe we need to be hearing God even when we're demoralized To be honest, Han and I, while this whole revival stuff's been happening this week, if we're completely honest with ourselves, we have not had the greatest week. And I I won't share our week because we'll actually be here until the next load shedding. It's been one of those weeks. But actually, when we're in that state of being demoralized, we are still listening for the voice of God, and we're still hearing, actually, I've been fishing all night. And we've been fishing all night. And actually, it's about sometimes we just need to put the net here. And this morning, I can say I moved my net there, and I've had the most beautiful morning. I don't know if you guys have been feeling it, but yeah. I know Wayne and I have. eh? If it's just us, that's enough. But it's, it's been so beautiful to actually, in the moments of your despair, to say, I will still be faithful. I will still cast my net where you tell me, and you will have a catch greater than you've ever seen. And if you've been seeing what's been going on out there and being like, ah, I'm not seeing any fish in my net. I promise you, just listen a little longer and keep fishing. And you know, my title of my preach today, and sorry, that's not my introduction and now I'm giving my title. (laughs) But the title of my preach today is Faith is Better Than Fairy Tales. No matter what I can conjure up in my way, in my path, God actually still has a better way. No matter if I'm a professional fisherman and I think here is the place to fish, I promise you, if God says it's here, it will be here. You know, when we see when Jesus uh, was telling his disciples that he was gonna get crucified, in their fairy tale, I bet they thought they were gonna live out their days walking with the Messiah. How beautiful they'd seen miracles. They wanna see miracles for another 32 years. They wanna see it till the end of their days. They wanna walk with Jesus. It's been, it's been so beautiful the last three years of, of my life with Jesus. Let's carry on like this. And Jesus says, no, I'm gonna get crucified. Peter says, no, I don't believe it. Not in my fairy tale to the point where he comes to get arrested like he predicted and he comes and he tries to cut off the ear of the, the God, and God and Jesus is like, Peter, if only you knew. If your fairy tale walked out and I just lived my days here with you doing miracles, actually I would not be able to save creation. Mm. You know, when David took on Goliath, the plan was to put David in heavy armor 
and go take on Goliath in his own game, which is sword on sword. And David said, no, I'm going to use a sling and a stone. And sometimes the world says doing things this way makes the most sense. Sending David out with a sling and a stone does not make sense in this world. But actually, God's way will see greater things than our fairy tales. And he stood out there with a sling and a stone and he killed him. And so, just like we've been talking about pride and obedience, such a, such a cool setup for me. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys in the front. Beautiful setup for me. That actually, if we are walking in pride and a lack of obedience, we will not be doing the things that faith says we should be doing. Because we are so convinced of our fairy tales. And I, I'm going to share a testimony about my life, um, about how I, how I experienced this. And just so you know, there, there's, a, there's a scripture in Revelation that's um, talking about, it says, we will conquer the dragon through the power of the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. And so there's power in testimony, and there's actually power in all our testimonies. And I'm sure all of us have, have a story that's going to be similar to what I'm going to share now. But I remember in the beginning of... Uh, can I get my water there, babe? There you are. Thanks. Thank you, my wife. <laughs> so, 2018. Crazy, that was like five years ago now, hey, guys? <laughs> crazy. Um, in the beginning of the year, I felt like God put the scripture on my heart, and actually, I, 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 it's not like a common thing that I do every year, let's see what scripture. This was actually the first time in my life where I felt like God had given me a scripture for the year. And I was like, that's, that's significant. I'm going I'm to hear that. I'm gonna, I literally wrote it. I made it like my screen cover or whatever like that. And it was from Ephesians 3 verse 20. And there's lots of different versions. And, but I, I'm reading from ESV now. It says, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we can ask or think according to the power of, uh, at work within us. And I was like, Woo! That's, yes, it's going to be a good year. Oh, my word. Better than I could think or imagine. God's going to do that more abundantly than that. Oh, yes, Lord. What a treat. I was getting excited. The fairy tales were popping, eh? Um, and at that time, I, I was in a relationship of three years. I was on the path of, uh, of corporate ladder. I was in my like, final year of studies. I hadn't failed a year yet. The buddies were proud. Eh? You're sending to Vasti. He's passing. What a treat. He's not addicted to drugs. You know, he's doing all the things. Um, <laughs> proud, proud parents. That's the amen, amen. <laughs> so I was like, sure. So it's going this well now. I can only like... Even my imagination, it's beyond that. So I'm like, sure, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pass well. You know, like I'm, I'm in this relationship now. We're going to probably get married by the end of the year even now. You know, it's like sheep. It's, wow, you know. My health was getting better and I was fit and strong. And I was like, oh, wow, better than this. Oh, my word, I can't wait. I can't wait. And I started imagining all these things. And who's had a season like that where they're like, Phew, God's given me this word. And he's like, he's going to do good things for me, you know. Oh, man. And uh, so... And then, sheepers, guys, I tell you what, eh? not, not, listen, it, well, the scripture is right, not what I could think or imagine, but for the complete opposite reasons. Eh? My, my, my girlfriend of three years, we broke up, and I was like, oh my word, that's, that's not great. Started failing, you know, failing's not fun, no matter when you do it. Started failing, I was, guys, I was literally in like a, like a month, I was like crying myself to sleep, I couldn't sleep, I, oh, I felt terrible, eh? and it, like, honestly, the, the lowest point of my life, not even kidding, like, literally, right there was the lowest point of my life, and I was still so faithful, I was like worshipping every day, and like, as I was crying myself to sleep, there was worship music in the background, all that stuff, but I remember saying, I was like, Lord, and I was being so sincere, I wasn't even being like, uh, like facetious or anything, I was saying, Lord, I, I really think you, you gave this word to the wrong person. I, I was like, I don't know how it happened, but it, you missed, you know? Like, maybe you're aiming for my roommate. I'll give you his coordinates. Maybe it was someone else, another Stephen. But you, you just missed. Like, obviously, this is my Job year, you know? Like, you maybe should have given me a scripture from Job or something like that. Uh, but you, re you just missed it. Now, I was being 100% sincere. 
I literally, I was like, ah, you know, I don't know how, but this mistake happened, you know, like, I, like the SA Postal Service, you know, it just, it just missed. Um, and I didn't think much more of it, you know, but life carries on and you build resilience and you, you take another step and you go the next day and eventually you stop crying and it's like, it's okay. And, you know, you get back into the gym or whatever it is, you know, and, and, and life kind of carries on, you know. Um, and, and beyond that, because I failed my year, um, parents were still proud of me. I was surprised by that, but I was chuffed. Um, anyway, so I, I started working. Uh, I, I needed to redo my honors, but I thought I'm not just redoing honors. That was terrible. I'll do something else. So I started working um, at, the, at the coffee shop at the back. Um, and in that year, things started to happen that I didn't realize until recently. But I... Uh, I started to gain like a hunger for like small business. And I was like, what, what's, how does this work? You know? And I was looking at the numbers and understanding. I'd studied accounting. I was doing a, a, a four majors at the same time. And I understood all the things in, in theory, but I started to understand it in person and, and uh, in an actual small business. Um, I started to, to gain a hunger for that and investment. And, and so I started, I had some spare time. And so I started buying like residential properties for um, for uh, like passive income, and I started to gain a hunger for this, and I started to get involved in the young adults here because I was I was on campus. I would have been in Flanga. I probably would have uh, moved down there, and my corporate ladder journey would have started. But a whole bunch of things changed, and now in the beginning of this year, Han and I were were in the car together, and we were saying, you know, what what does what is a word for our year? And it was the first time in five years that I was like maybe I should think about a scripture for the year. And instantly I remembered that I had the scripture in Ephesians that God can do far more abundantly than I could think or imagine. And I started to think, I was like, back then, what was I thinking? What was I imagining? And what I was thinking and imagining was not what a small business looked like. What does a coffee shop look like? What does residential property look like? What does a life with a perfect wife look like. <laughs> and I wasn't thinking about those things, but all of a sudden this year, I was like, oh my word, God knew even better, and now the life I have now is, is ex exceedingly better than I thought it would have been. I was involved in the church transition, and I understood what Hillside was needing at the time. I, I, I'm, I'm co-leading the young adults now, but it started back then. I owned two coffee shops, and five years ago, I wasn't even drinking coffee. I could never have imagined that. And I've got my CA now, and that's great, and I've got this amazing job lined up, and I've got seven tenants and different properties and stuff like that, but none of that I was imagining back then. And maybe we can call up the band. But I want to say that there have been promises, even over this house, about revival. Revival. And I want to say, church, it is not going to look like we expect it to. And thank goodness for that. Thank goodness it doesn't look like our flesh thinks it should look like. Because it's not going to be nearly as spectacular. But thank goodness that we have faith more than we have fairy tales. Because our faith will lead to way greater things than our fairy tales. You know, in Proverbs 3, verse 5 to 7, it's that classic that says, but lean not on your own understanding, but in all ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. And as we walk on this path, we will see revival. But something quite important here is that actually this path isn't a path that goes from one revival to another revival, from one beautiful evening service and encounter to another. It is actually a path that is still directed at the object of our faith, which is Jesus. It is so pointless to make a statement like faith is better than fairy tales without telling us today that the object of our faith is still Jesus Christ. And just as faith is better than fairy tales, the resurrection is better than revival. And that's why today we are going to break bread. Not because we're saying we're putting revival on pause, but because we're saying revival looks like us chasing Jesus Christ and his resurrection. 
And that's why we've been so strategic in our wording of our, our revival in this space. And we're not, we, we are saying you are coming here to adore the King. And what happens, just like an Asprey where they said it felt like the most ordinary service. When we focus on Jesus, we can see the ordinary translate into the most incredible extraordinary. And just as the word repentance and revival are linked, as we come up to break bread, I want to encourage us to repent of where we have prioritized our fairy tales before our faith in the King. I want us to shift our focus to instead of chasing revival, we are chasing what happened on the resurrection. And as we do that, I'm so excited to see my King glorified. So I want to invite you up. We have some stations in the corners over here. And take a moment to remember what the object of our faith is. That our King came to earth to die for us, to restore the whole of humanity, to connect creation to the Creator once more, to save your life so that we may worship Him. So you can join me now.